How's it going? <laughs> Good to see y'all. Um, I'm on double duty today, and I blame Ryan, Tone, and Sam. But Sam got married, so he's, he's off the hook. Uh, I do want to say a little bit about that, though. So Sam's, he's done. He's married, okay? Ladies, he's, he's done. But Tone, Antonio Vargo, it's a good last name. He is available. <laughs> no one in the picture, okay? Keep that in mind, ladies. All right, so um, another thing, okay? It's nice. We have a fundraiser on Wednesday for the youth group. I'm glad I'm preaching because I get to say, be there, all right? Be there. It's always a great time. Uh, bingo's a good time if you guys have never been before. Uh, if you can't be there, the reason that we do these fundraisers is so we can raise money for our students to go on summer trips, and on those summer trips, the goal is to share the gospel with them, to teach them about Christ so that they can grow closer to him. Uh, everything we're doing is for the kingdom of God, for his glory. Uh, so, of course, we ask you, if you're willing to give, if you're cheerful to give for our youth group, give to that cause, whether it's by going to the fundraiser, by just giving in the offering, it doesn't matter. Uh, those are the reasons that we do those things, okay? So it's, it's Communion Sunday. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, the title this morning is The God of Reconciliation. The God of Reconciliation. You know, we serve. We serve an amazing God. We, we serve an amazing God. There, there is no one like our God. There's no one like him. The things that he has done for us, the things that he continues to do for us, are, are truly, truly amazing. Uh, reconciliation, this definition, let's look at it real quick. It's, it's to restore friendly relations, or it's, it's to bring back what's broken, okay? To bring it back together. It's to take something that's broken, typically talking about relations, and to take that relationship and to bring it together again, okay? And we know with our biblical knowledge, because of sin, we are broken in our relationship with God. This goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. In the garden, they walked and talked with God. Think about that. They walked and talked with him, the intimacy of that, to be with God. To know him personally, to conversate with him, to walk with him. This is what they had in the garden. But as soon as they sinned, what happened? Well, they were cast out. What's the picture? They were cast out of their relationship with God. Their relationship with God was broken because of their sin. And so because of this broken relationship, God must reconcile. He must reconcile. And this is the thing we're going to learn about God today, how amazing that is. But, you know, it's interesting in, in talking about this, the love of God, the grace of God to reconcile, okay, has to be loving, has to be gracious. But we always look at the Old Testament, right? And everybody asks these questions, okay? We look at God and we see his wrath. We see his judgment. He, he literally opens the ground and swallows thousands of people and then just shuts it like it's nothing. He tells the Israelites, listen, go and destroy those nations. And he says, don't leave women alive, don't leave children alive, no one. Not even the livestock. Everything dies. And we see all these, and everyone's like, how can you say your God is loving? How can you say your God is gracious? When all he does is destroy, and he's wrathful. He doesn't even care for his own people. He puts judgment on them. These are the questions we get, right? But the reality is, in thinking about that question, I will tell you two problems. Number one, we do not understand the holiness and the justice of God. That's the first problem. And the second problem is we don't understand the wickedness of our own sin. Our own sin. And the real question, that's the wrong question. Here's the real question. Why does a just holy God allow sinners to live another second? Why does he allow sinners to live another second? One of my biggest problems as I was struggling with my doubts that I talked about was you look at the world today, okay? Look how corrupt and evil our world is. Russia is attacking Ukraine because they just want their land, right? Uh, you have America that you see in depravity over and over again. We just continue spiraling downhill. 
We look at all these. You look at ISIS, right, and what they're doing in the Middle East. All this stuff. And here's the question. We hear about it constantly over and over again. And the day goes by, and we go to sleep, and we wake up, and what? Nothing happens. Just keeps going on, right? Just continually moving forward as sin continues to go, and these people, these evil people that we see, they continue to live. They eat food, most of the time good food. Um, they do whatever they want, right, in their pride and their evilness. And I was like, man, what, what is going on here? Okay, I look at the Bible, I'm like, God is definitely holy and he's definitely just. So why, why does he just let all this continue? It's the same question as the psalmist. Why does he let this go on? Well, here's why. 2 Peter 3, 9. And this is talking about the day of the Lord when Jesus is going to return. And he is going to get rid of all evil, all sin. It's all going to be destroyed. And he says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Think about that. That God, in his patience, does not want anybody to perish. Not one person. He doesn't want anyone. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter how much sin they've committed. You know, it, it's like one, one time I heard a pastor, this was during Barack Obama when he was president. He's like, man, some people are praying that Barack Obama, you know, that he gets saved and he changes. And he says, I, I pray that Barack Obama dies and goes to hell. That's what he said. Do, do you think God agrees with that? Not even close, right? So in the same circumstance, what do we pray for our leaders? What do we pray for President Biden? That he becomes saved. That he knows Christ. Because this is what our God wants. This is why our God is patient with the entire world. is because he wants us to know. This is why God is patient with us. With you. With me. I'm so glad God is patient. Are you not? Are you so glad that he's patient with us? That he waited for us to know. And he showed us the cross. And he showed us how to come to him. This is our God. This is our Savior, our gracious and loving God. So the question is, God is a God of reconciliation. How is this? How is he a God of reconciliation? Okay, let's go ahead and find out. Uh, um, I want to pray one more time before we continue. God, I thank you that you are a God who loves us and is gracious. The truth is, is you are just and you are going to pour your wrath out on sin. Sin is going to face your wrath. Um, and so I pray, Lord, if there is anybody in here who is still in their sin, that they would listen to this message intently and that they would come to know Christ. Um, Lord, we need you every second. We need you every day. You are everything that we need. And so help us to know this, to thrive through you to abide in you, to look to you, to cling to you in all things. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we finished off last week, Pastor Frank, um, follow along in the verses beforehand, and, and what Paul finishes off with is he says that in Christ, Christ has died for all, okay? He's died for all, and all have died with Christ. All have died with Christ, okay? That all is not referring to every person in the world. That all is referring to all those who come to Christ for salvation. He has died for all of them, one time, once and for all, one death. But he says, all have died with him. We have all died with him. What does that mean? It means that our sin, our sinful flesh, our sinful selves, when we came and put our faith in Christ, our sinful self was on the cross with him, and we'll get to this later, and it died with him. It died with him. Our sin, our guilt, our shame, everything that we've done, everything we'll do until the day that we die, died with Christ on the cross. Uh, Paul makes this really personal for himself in Galatians 2.20. He says about himself, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? 
And so Christ lives inside of him. It's no longer him who lives. He died on the cross with Christ. His sinful flesh and sinful self died, and now Christ lives through him. What does this mean? Well, number one, it means we are a new creation. We're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17, let's read this. It says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. And then here it is. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. This is, this is one of the most profound statements in the entirety of the New Testament. That you are a new creation. You could probably preach about 10, maybe 15 sermons on just this one sentence. You're a new creation in Christ. Um, to, to see this, we have to understand, to be a new creation means there was an old one, right? This old creation, this old self, who we were before Christ. I want to put this on the board if we have it. If we don't, that's okay. Uh, the old self, okay? You're a slave to sin. You're a slave to sin. You are a slave to your prideful, selfish living. That's the old self. You are cursed under the law. The law puts a curse on you. And because of that curse, you are accursed, set apart from God. You are an enemy of God. And you are regarded as a sinner in the eyes of God. This is the self apart from Christ. Apart from Christ, we are nothing but slaves to sin, living in our own prideful living, regarded as sinners, and the wrath of God abides on us. That's the old self. But now he says, listen, though, that, that self, that prideful self, that slave to sin, it died on the cross with Christ. And now you are a new creation. And this new creation, this new self is what? Well, through Christ, you are set free from sin. Sin does not have a hold on you anymore. It has no dominion over you because you've been set free from that sin. You're not under law anymore. You're not cursed by the law because, in fact, Jesus became a curse for you. But you are under grace. You live under grace. You're not an enemy of God anymore. You are now regarded as a child of God, adopted by him. And you are regarded as righteous. And we will look at this later as well. But, you know, one, one thing I love, going back to verse 15, he says this, And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Did you catch that? That, that the idea of a new self, the one before, we, we live for ourselves. We only care about ourselves. Um, I, I look back, you know, and, and it's like, even in my marriage, in my marriage of wanting to love my wife, and I, I do love my wife, and I love my wife even before. I'm not saying I didn't. But it still was, it, it still was all about me. It was all about me. It was like, what is, what is going to fulfill me in this relationship? What is going to benefit me? I grew up in the church, serving in the church. I will tell you, it was all about me, still all about me. How can I look good? Man, if I'm going to start singing, I better make sure I sing really, really good because I want it to be all about me, right? And this reality is that our sin makes us about ourselves. It makes us about ourselves. And when Christ steps in and when we put our faith in Christ, there is a change where it's not about us anymore. It's all about him. It's all about him. And I ask you today, because I love you, has that change taken place? Has there been a change in your heart where before your life was about you, but now it's about Christ? It's about Christ. 
And no, this is not a perfection thing. It's not always about Christ. Man, I still mess up all the time. But a majority of my life is now for him. It's for his glory. It's for his kingdom. And I ask you, who better to live for than the one who gave his life for us on the cross? Is there really anybody else better to live for? And the fact that when we live for him, it only provides a better relationship in everything else in our life too. Your marriage, your children, your friends, your church family. It all just gets better when you live for him. That's the amazing part. And so we are a new self because of Christ. He also talks about the fact that we were guarded according to the flesh. He says we even regarded Christ according to the flesh. The idea is, is we were guarded as sinners under the law. The flesh is talking about the law, the physical outward appearance. And that law, it was regarding us as sinners. But we're no more regarded by that. We're not regarded by our flesh. Because think about it. If you were still regarded by your flesh, well, guess what? You still sin every day. Every day. So if you are regarded by your flesh, then you are regarded as a sinner. But you're not. Because you are regarded by the grace of God through Jesus who died and took your sins for you. So you're not under the law anymore. You're not under the flesh anymore. You're under grace. And it's all because of Christ. It's all because of Christ. Um, we got to move on from this. But what I will say, last thing about being a new creation, I urge you, get in the word of God and learn what it means to be a new creation. Learn about it. And you can read any book you want, and it's going to tell you, because it's all about this. It's all about how Christ has changed us, and he's molded us, and how we live now as believers is all in God's word, okay? So we'll move on to our second point, okay? Number two, and it's, it's a, basically a full sentence. We are a new creation through God who reconciles, through God who reconciles. Verse 20, or sorry, verse 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. I love that last sentence. There's two things I want to see here. Number one, our ministry is to tell people about God's reconciliation. This is our main ministry. Paul says it over and over again. At first he says, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us this ministry. The apostles were specifically given the ministry by Jesus himself to what? Go out, make disciples, teach them, and baptize them in my name, in the name of the Trinity, right? This is their ministry. Their ministry is to share the reconciliation of God. To go out and say, hey, hey, listen, you can be reconciled to God. You can come to God and you can know him. You can live with him. You can be with God. This is our message. And let me tell you how. Here's how. Through Christ. Through Christ. What does Paul say? We preach Christ crucified. That's it. That's what we preach. Why? Because through Christ you can be reconciled to him. You can come to God. He says more. He says it, it, it's entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God has entrusted this message to us. And then he finishes with the big one. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. And you guys know what an ambassador is. Honestly, I was like, I don't really know what that is at first, but I had to look it up. That's okay. Okay, and the idea, honestly, you know what I think about an ambassador? And I mean, no, if you're an ambassador in here, I mean, no offense to you. Um, an ambassador, honestly, you're just a messenger. You're just a messenger. That's what an ambassador is. They go, and they are the one who brings the message or is the one that comes for the one that's important. 
we go for the one that's important. We're not the important ones. You look at that word, you're like, man, ambassador, that's a cool word. That's nice. I like that. Okay? It's not cool. You're not cool. Christ is cool. Okay? Christ is the amazing one. And Christ takes us, sinners, bent for hell, bent for the wrath of God. He takes us, he changes us into a new creation and says, now you're my ambassador. You're my ambassador now. And I want you to go, and I want you to tell everybody how they can be reconciled to me. Do you see this? How we share this message? How we say, listen, guys, I want you to know you can come to God. And what is the biggest proof for you that you can go and tell others they can be reconciled? Uh, You're reconciled. That you are reconciled to God. The fact that Christ has come into my life, and when I read these verses, they are so true that he has changed me that he has molded me into a new creation and it's all because of his grace and it's all because that he came and he died for me and he set me apart because he loves me and i can go out and i can tell others that hey you can be reconciled to god because god has reconciled to me and i love that paul you know and timothy he preaches he's like listen The saying is trustworthy and of full acceptance, full acceptance, that Christ died for sinners of who I am the foremost. Why was Paul so willing and so courageous to say Christ died for sinners? Because he was one. And he knew that in being a sinner, Christ loved him and died for him and took his place. And the the idea, guys, is that the apostles were given the ministry to teach others about the reconciliation of God. And the ministry has never stopped since. We have the same ministry to tell others that they can be reconciled to God. And the one thing I'm going to say about this, if we are struggling to share the gospel, if we're struggling, I want you to realize this. If nobody shared the gospel with you, you're not sitting here today. You're not sitting here. If somebody did not get up, whether it was at a church or they came to you as a stranger or wherever it was as a friend, a family member, it doesn't matter. If they were not willing to share the gospel with you, then you don't know the gospel. You don't know the gospel. And so we, in the same way, as being reconciled, as coming to God, of having the the most amazing privilege there is of having our sin forgiven and knowing Christ We have the ministry to tell others about that so that they may know, so that they may come. And again, I love it. It doesn't matter their sin. It doesn't matter who they are. We're not looking for good people. We are looking for sinners to tell them that they can come to God. And the last thing about this is that it says, God making his appeal through us. That's the greatest part. Okay, we're the ambassadors, we go out and we share the message, but do you know who is speaking through us? It's God himself. It's God who wants to be reconciled. It's God who wants to bring people to him. And so when we go out and we share the gospel and we tell people about Jesus and what he's done for us and how they can come to God, God is appealing to them through us. Is that not incredible? That God is literally saying, Please come to me. Please come to me. Please believe in Christ. Please know Christ. This is just my messenger, but the one I really want you to know is me. I want you to know me. I want you to come to me. This is the point, is knowing God. And so he's appealing through us. And this is the the second thing that we see from the verses, and this is what makes the first one, is the fact that he says what? All this is from God. All of it is from God. To be reconciled to God, to have the ministry of sharing the reconciliation of God, it's all from Him. It's all from Him. He's the one who did the reconciling. He's the one who brought us back to Him. He's the one who sent His Son. He is the one who is willing to crush the Son for us. He is the one who gives us life. He is the one who brings us to Him. It's all from him. It's all from him. Who deserves the glory? Christ, the Father. That's it. Because it all comes from him. And then he finishes the last point, right? He says, so 
after explaining it, right, after saying, you can be reconciled to God. It's all from him. So he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He's like, hey, you guys who are reading this letter, you guys are listening to this message, come be reconciled to God. Come know God. You can. You can. Without a shadow of a doubt, you can come to God and know him and be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. And this is uh, the last point that we have. Point three. We are a new creation through God who reconciles through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Um, Let me tell you this. There is no reconciliation without Jesus Christ. There's no reconciliation. If there is no Christ, if Christ is not our Savior, then there is no way to be reconciled to God. Our wrath, or the wrath of God, abides on us because of our sin. We are all sinners. We have all sinned against the holy and just God. And if Christ has not saved us, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are not reconciled to God. And this is what verse 21 is saying. And this is, this is the climax right here, verse 21. This is the verse we need to understand because this verse is telling us how we are reconciled to God, why we are reconciled to God, and how a person can come as a sinner and be made righteous because of Christ. It says this, verse 21, for our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. First of all, he starts off and says, for our sake, for our sake. I already noticed the love and grace of God. That for the sake of us sinners, and you've got to remember, what does Romans say? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did not die for you after you loved him, after you obeyed him, after you came to him. He died for you before you even knew him. While you were an enemy, while you were a sinner, he came and died for you. So for our sake, for the sake of sinners, for the sake of sinners, he did what? Well, number one, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Christ knows no sin. Sin. Christ is he's fully God. He's fully God. Holy and just. In all ways. Trice holy, right? We call him. And he is perfectly righteous. There is no sin in Christ at all. Uh, the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There is not a human being in the history of the planet that for one second has fulfilled that commandment. Not one time. But Christ in his fullness, for all eternity, because it says he was never created, he's been in existence for all eternity, perfectly co-equal with the Father and the Spirit, has fully loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength forever. This is who Christ is. Fully righteous. And what does he do? He steps off his throne, as Paul says. He comes down and he takes the form of a servant, And in the form of a servant, he gets on the cross. And this perfect, righteous God, who's done nothing wrong, has loved us fully and completely, says he became sin. For our sake, he became sin. Well, Well, what does this mean, that he became sin? Does that mean that Christ became a sinner? No, no. He did not become a sinner on the cross. So what does it mean that he became sin? Well, let's look at some verses. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Galatians three thirteen. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. What's the point? The point is, is that when he became sin, he took our sin upon himself. The perfect creator of the universe, the loving God that we know, that we serve, that we worship, he took our sin upon himself. He took our sin upon himself. He doesn't deserve that. Does he deserve your sin? I mean, think of, think of the things that you know in the back of your mind. When they come into your mind, the sins that you've done, you, you want them to go away as fast as possible. As fast as possible, right? I know I do. I have some things in my life that, man, I hope nobody ever finds out. Nobody ever finds out that I did that. And the reality is, is that sin, that vile, disgusting sin, every sin that we commit every day was placed on Christ. It was put upon him on the cross, a perfect Savior. And then Isaiah 53.10 says this, it was the will of of the Lord to crush him, to crush him. And so when Jesus went to the cross, and when Jesus took our sin upon himself, it was the Father's will to then crush the Son with his wrath for the sake of our sin. Because being holy and being just, God's wrath must be served. It must be served. We know this. We read this throughout the Bible. Why does a person get sent to hell? Because of their sin and because the wrath of God is poured out on that person because of their sin. This is biblical. And so the wrath of God for us to be forgiven, for us to be made righteous, for us to enter into relationship with God, and for anyone to say, you can go to heaven where God is, that means that your sin has to be taken care of, has to be taken care of. And for it to be taken care of, our loving God says, in my will, here's my will, my will is to send my only son, and I give him up. And not only do I place him on a cross physically, not only do I put the nails in his hands and his legs, not only is he mocked and beaten, but I crush him with the weight of my wrath for the sake of your sin, for your sin. Your sin was placed on the Savior. And it was placed on the Savior to then finish the verse, right? He became sin who knew no sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we might become righteous in the eyes of God. Isaiah 53, 11, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. This is what Jesus has done for us. Our Savior took our sins, he bore our iniquities on the cross, and he bore the wrath that we deserved so that we might be accounted righteous, so that we might be made righteous righteous. And so God has given you his righteousness. He has taken your sin away, and he has clothed you with the righteousness of Christ. And that is why as a new creation, going back to the beginning, you are not a slave to sin anymore because Christ took your sin. You're under grace because the law has not covered you, and you are considered righteous because God has give you, given you his righteousness. And this is a done deal. It's a done deal. If Christ took your sin on the cross, is God going to punish your sin again when you die? No, that would be unjust to serve two sentences. Your sentence has already been served on the cross. And so the truth is, is if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are free from your sin because your Savior loved you and he took it for you and he made you righteous. And the last thing I will say, again, going back, listen, if you're, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus and you've never trusted in him, the reality is 
that he wants you to be reconciled to him. He wants you to come to him. And he wants you to know that he is willing to bear your iniquities so that you may be righteous. That's the way that he loves you. That's the way that he cares for you. And he is gracious to you. And he, just like he said in John 3, 16, right? God gave his son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And his promise is the same for you as it is anybody else in the room. So come, trust in Christ, know him, and be safe. Okay, let's go ahead and... Uh, Bow our heads, close our eyes. Um, we're going to take communion in a second. And, and um, once I'm done praying, you guys, we're, the communion's up at the front. You can come and you can grab your communion and you can take a seat. And then we're going to take that all together, okay? Um, but like I said at the beginning, who better to serve than the one who gave his life for us? Who better to serve? If you're here today and, and you're a believer serve Christ, know him, serve him, want, want to know him, want to serve him, want to obey him, desire him more and more, cut out anything you need to cut out so that you can come and know Christ more. If you're in here today, I, I can't, and you don't know Christ, I cannot urge you enough. You can know Christ. It's the greatest thing you can do. It's the greatest thing you can do. And I hope that God has appealed to you through my mouth so that you can know you can know God and you can come to him and he will love you and he will clothe you in righteousness and he will make you his child. God, thank you for everything that you've done. God, we are not worthy of the cross. We are not worthy of your righteousness. But somehow you come and you say, you are so gracious and so loving that you would give it to us, even though we don't deserve it. And, and you're like, I want, I want this for you. I want you to be righteous. I want you to know me. I want you to be with me for eternity. I thank you for that, God. I thank you for all that you are and all that you do. And I pray that you continue to lead us and guide us as a church into your holiness, into who you are so that we would live for your kingdom, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.